Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Please welcome the president of the Halifax International Security Forum, Mr. Peter Van Praag. How was that? <clears throat> Your Excellencies, Ministers, Members of Parliament, Members of the Congressional Delegation, Distinguished Officers, Ladies and Gentlemen, Colleagues and Friends. My name is Peter Van Praag, President of the Forum, and on behalf of everybody who has worked to put this gathering together for you, welcome to Halifax. Well, what a year it was. 1917. Anniversaries are not always a helpful way to look at the world, but using 100 years as a marker when no one in this room was yet alive can indeed serve as a measure of what we've learned and how far we've come, especially when that marker is the year 1917. For many people in Canada, the fact that the NHL, the National Hockey League, was created in 1917 cannot go unmentioned. If only the joys and the rivalries of sport were the only things that occupied minds in 1917. But when we think of the sheer magnitude of what was going on in the world just one century ago, we are inevitably drawn to a darker, to darker, more vexing issues. Issues that speak to the concerns that bring us to gatherings such as this one. As World War I continued to rage, this very city, Halifax, was all but destroyed. On December 6, 1917, the SS Mont Blanc, a French cargo ship loaded with ammunition and explosives and headed back to France, collided with the SS Imo, a Norwegian vessel in the Narrows, the strait connecting the upper Halifax Harbor to Bedford Basin. For the sake of reference, this hotel and all of downtown Halifax is built along the Narrows. More than 2,000 people were, injured, were, were killed by the explosion, and 9,000 more were injured. Indeed, the blast was the largest man-made explosion in human history prior to the nuclear age. Nearly all structures within a half mile radius were obliterated. A tsunami created by the blast wiped out the community of Mi'kmaq First Nations people who had lived in the Tufts Cove area for generations. Relief efforts began almost immediately and hospitals quickly became full. Rescue trains began arriving from across eastern Canada and the northeastern United States. The bonds built between Atlantic Canada and New England as a result of the Halifax explosion remain real and very strong to this day. Canada had been fighting at enormous cost in Europe for more than three years when that tragedy struck. But it was the Halifax explosion that in many ways brought home to North America the reality of the war in Europe. But 1917 was also the year that brought the United States into the war, ensuring its victorious outcome for the Allied powers. In 1917, the Russian Revolution gave emerging liberal democratic capitalism its first great rival system in the 20th century. In 1917, the year that a young David Ben-Gurion arrived in Nova Scotia to train with a British battalion that would eventually make its way to the Holy Land, the Balfour Declaration that would set in motion seismic changes, changes in the Middle East was issued 100 years ago this month. And women's suffrage movements were on the march to give democracy real and complete meaning to the 50% of our populations that had not by then achieved, even achieved formal equality. I could go on, a lot can happen in 100 years. 
And it's not just that there remains more to do to bring peace and justice to this world. Looking back from that somewhat accessible, yet not quite accessible, hundred years, helps us understand that doubt and struggle and injustice, just like democracy, reconciliation, and peace, are never quite complete. Who wins and what prevails are determined by what we do and by the standard, standards and values that we choose to adopt, that we choose to stand, stand up for, that we choose to fight for. That is why at Halifax, unique among major global conferences, we ask ourselves, what is it that we aim to secure? Do we know? Are we sure? This year we ask peace, prosperity, principle, securing what purpose? Identifying our common purpose as democracies is no small feat, and yet, through discussion, through better understanding, and through some compromise, we must aim to do so. Today, over 300 participants have traveled from over 80 countries to join a select group of fellow democratic thinkers to have a real conversation about international security and the challenges facing our nations now and into the future. In a moment, you will hear from the Hon Honorable Har Harjit Sajjan, Canada's Minister Nation of National Defense and your host for the weekend. But quickly, I do want to explain how it works here at Halifax International Security Forum. You will find that the agenda is most importantly relevant, and I want to thank our agenda working group who worked with me during the summer to ensure, to ensure all major issues were addressed. In the red program that you've all received, you will find short opinion essays by distinguished authors, many of whom join us this weekend. They set the stage for the plenary panels. They are meant to start the conversation, and without exception, they are excellent. Please take time to read them. Bill McCaffrey, founder of Calgary-based Meg Energy, founded the Halifax Canada Club seven years ago to ensure that industry's ideas for international security are included in the conversations here at Halifax. Thank you. Thank you also, Nancy Southern, CEO of ATCO, for your unwavering support. Mr. Ahmet Chalik, Chairman of Istanbul, Turkey-based Chalik Holding, and Mr. Savash Erdem, CEO of Ankara, Turkey-based Oyak. And welcome, Mr. Mark Allen, President of Boeing International, our newest member of the Halifax Canada Club. Welcome to Canada, Mark. Together, the Halifax Canada Club ensures that the work we do here this weekend and throughout the year will continue. Bill, Nancy, Ahmet, Savash, and Mark, and senior members of their teams will be identified this weekend with a gold lobster lapel pin. When you have a chance, please thank them for their very generous support. Thank you also to NATO and a special welcome to Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. NATO has supported the forum since the beginning and it is altogether appropriate that we thank NATO this evening with our Builders Award. Thank you Foreign Affairs Magazine and new this year Foreign Policy Magazine, our media partners. Thank you to CAE, Gartner, CCC, L3 Technologies, Ipsos, and DLA Piper. I want to thank Joe Hall, our Vice President, and I want to thank members of our Board of Directors for their leadership and for being with us this weekend. Jonathan Weistub, Jonathan Tepperman, David, Cr David, <coughs> excuse me, David Kramer, and General Counsel Dean Felk. They are strong leaders and my true partners in this endeavor. Thank you to the Government of Canada, the Department of National Defense, and the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, ACOA, for your enthusiastic support. Thank you, Minister Bryson, for your support. Specifically, I thank Minister Sajjan for your leadership and your commitment to what we do now and into the future. General Vance, Chief of Defense Staff, thank you for your confidence in us too. For everyone's situational awareness, you need to know that I've given my word to General Vance that the forum will run on time, 
all weekend long. That means on time, I intend to keep my word to General Vance. Of course, none of this would be possible without you, our participants. Thank you for making the trip. Senator Shaheen, a special thank you for your commitment. For those of you, like Senator Shaheen, who have been here before, you already know that we take great pride in creating an atmosphere that provokes serious conversation and debate. I encourage you to help your colleagues and new friends who are here for the first time in any way you can. And there are some special people here this weekend for the first time. President Hashim Tachi of Kosovo, Chief Executive Abdullah of Afghanistan, General Halusi Akar, Chief of the Defense Staff of the Turkish Armed Forces, and Nobel Laureate Tawakal Karman among them. Thank you. And now a quick word on behalf of our communications team. Please feel free, while keeping your phones on silent, to use social media to convey your thoughts throughout our on-the-record sessions. Do not have any thoughts at all during our off-the-record sessions. <laughs> our hashtag is hashtag HISF, H-I-S-F, 2017. And please don't mind that I plug our new podcast, Pete and Steve's The World, out now and available on our website, iTunes, and of course, Google Play. It's insightful, it's irreverent, and it's funny, and your teenage children will love it. On the eve of the 100th anniversary of the Halifax International, no, on the eve of the 100th anniversary of the Halifax explosion, I thank the city of Halifax and the people of Halifax for hosting all of us this weekend. In fact, the true secret to our success is this gorgeous venue and the warmth it provides. I will just mention that we have many local volunteers from the community. They are identified by their white lanyards and I know are looking forward to helping you. Foreign policy and security policy is no different than all public policy. It is about people. Maintaining people's trust and people's confidence is fundamental and can never be taken for granted. Democratic leaders understand this. It is people who lend their leaders their power. But that power from the people is only on loan. As China challenges, as, as Russia interferes, as North Korea threatens, and as international terrorism continues, all at a time that the world adapts to a new style of American leadership, the conversations held this weekend will indeed have some bearing on how future generations, 100 years from now, judge how we identified and secured our common purpose. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to welcome Baroness Michelle Koninx, Assistant, Assistant Secretary General and Executive Director of the United Nations Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. Prior to her, her appointment in August 2017, Baroness Koninx was the President of Eurojust, the, the Judicial Cooperation Unit of the European Unit, Union. Please join me in welcoming her to Halifax. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Secretary General, I wish to thank uh, Mr. Peter Van Preek, President of the Halifax International Security Forum, for inviting us here today. Unfortunately, the Secretary General is unable to be here with us today. He has asked me to represent him and to convey his best wishes for a successful event. As many of you are aware, the Secretary General yesterday delivered a speech in London reaffirming the fundamental requirements as affirmed in numerous resolutions of the Sec Security Council to ensure respect for human rights and the rule of law in countering terrorism. 
a welcome to Secretary General's remarks, and I also welcome his recent, recent reforms of the United Nations counterterrorism architecture, including his establishment of the Office of Counterterrorism under the leadership of Under Secretary General Vladimir Voronkov. I look forward to working with the Under Secretary General to further strengthen the coherence of United Nations counterterrorism activities. Ladies and gentlemen, our topic today is among the most difficult and challenges, challenging of all times, of our time. How to effectively combat global terrorism. Terrorism is fundamentally the denial and violation of basic human rights. Protecting human rights means addressing the root causes of terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize three points. First, terrorism should not be associated with any religion, ethnicity and race. Second, terrorism can never be, never be justified. And third, no country is immune to terrorism. Last year, terrorist attacks occurred in more than 100 countries, resulting in more than 25,000 25, deaths and 33,000 injuries. And we should never forget that the vast majority of all terrorist attacks take place in develop, developing countries. If we are to ensure an effective response to the global terrorist threat, we must address its root causes. Lack of development, lack of good governance, extreme poverty, inequality, exclusion and discrimination are drivers of terrorism and violent extremism. Exploitation of information and communications technologies including the internet and social media, increasingly enables terrorist groups to disseminate violent extremist propaganda, attract new recruits and raise funds. Although the drivers of radicalization to violence vary from case to case, terrorism thrives wherever there is a sense of resentment, humiliation or exclusion and lack of education. That is why the protection of human rights, all human rights, including economic, social and cultural rights, must be part of the solution. Ladies and gentlemen, military operations in Syria and Iraq have succeeded in driving ISIL from its strongholds in Mosul, Raqqa, Palmyra and Deir al sur but military operations alone will never eradicate terrorism. We must address the root causes. That's why we must work together through comprehensive approaches that involve all sectors of our society. In this regard, the Secretary General intends to propose six priorities for our collective work to combat the global terrorist threat. First, we must continue to strengthen international cooperation. As you all are aware, there is still no global consensus on a comprehensive convention on international terrorism. However, there are 19 international counterterrorism instruments, as well as many regional instruments, which provide a comprehensive legal basis for cooperation in bringing terrorists to justice. Those instruments are complemented by a number of Security Council resolutions, including and stemming the flow of foreign terrorist fighters, the imposition of financial measures against terrorist groups, and more recently, international judicial cooperation. Many member states continue to require capacity building, support and technical assistance to implement these global rules. Next year, the Secretary General intends to convene 
the first ever UN summit of heads of counterterrorism agencies in an effort to promote new partnerships and build relationships of trust. Second, we must ensure a focus on prevention through sustainable development. The promotion of sustainable development is the most effective way to tackle the poverty, inequality and lack of opportunity and public services that engender despair and frustration that may in turn lead to radicalization. Third, investment in young people must be a major element of prevention strategies. Jobs, education and vocational training for young people must be a priority in national development plans and in international development cooperation. Fourth, we must win the battle on the internet. Terrorists may be losing physical ground in Syria and Iraq, but they are gaining virtual ground in cyberspace. Fifth, upholding human rights and the rule of law is the safest way to prevent a vicious circle of instability and resentment. We must address messages of hate with messages of inclusivity, diversity and the protection of minorities and other vulnerable groups. Lastly, we must amplify the voices of the victims of terrorism. When we respect the human rights of victims and provide them with support, we begin to repair the damage done by terrorists to individuals, communities and societies. I do thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome the Honorable Scott Bryson, President of the Treasury Board of Canada and Senior Minister for Nova Scotia, before being appointed to his current position as President of the Treasury Board. Mr. Bryson was elected to Canada's House of Commons in seven general elections between 1997 and 2015. Minister Bryson, please. Thank you, Peter, and good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Halifax International Security Forum. I, I have an easy job to do today. I'm here to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, the, our extraordinary Minister of National Defense, Harjit Sajjan. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be totally politically correct today, Harjit, so relax. Um, before I do that, I would be remiss as a Nova Scotian uh, to not take this opportunity to welcome you to our province. We're very proud of Nova Scotia. We're very proud of, of Halifax. It's fitting that you have this conference here in Halifax because um, Halifax, for Halifax, security and defense has really been at the center of Halifax's existence going back to 1749. And at the heart of our government's commitment to the world is Lieutenant Colonel retired Harjit Sajjan. Harjit joined the BC Regiment in 1989. He served overseas in Bosnia and Herzegovina, three times in Afghanistan. Before he entered politics, he was an 11-year veteran of the Vancouver Police Department, serving as a detective uh, with their gang crimes unit specializing in drug trafficking and, and organized crime. He's a badass. He really is. He really is. You don't mess with this guy. Harge was the first Sikh to command a Canadian Army Reserve Regiment, the first to be named Minister of National Defense in November of 2015. And when Harge speaks at the cabinet table, he doesn't speak of things that are theoretical. He has worn the Canadian flag on his sleeve, and it's with that credibility that he brings defense and security matters to our cabinet table. He knows that his decisions have consequences. They have to be backed up by the brave men and women who serve this country and, and yours. 
That is something that Harj Sajjan never forgets. He has championed billions of dollars worth of investment in military personnel and equipment. He has pushed for a suicide prevention strategy for soldiers and veterans. He's a relentless advocate for diversity and the important role that women play in our Canadian Armed Forces. And just this week, Mr. Sajjan reconfirmed Canada's commitment to peacekeeping and launched the Vancouver Principles designed to prevent the recruitment and use of child soldiers in conflicts around the world. This morning, when I was given some information on this, 53 nations had signed on. By this afternoon, 56 nations have signed on already, and there will be more to come because it's hard to say no to Harjit Sajjan. I know that because I'm president of the Treasury Board. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome your host for this weekend, my friend and colleague, Canada's Minister of National De Defense, Harjit Sajjan. Great stuff, man. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, it's a, it's a real privilege to actually be here with Scott, and uh, you got to realize uh, if he's about to introduce you, uh, I mean, he's got tremendous experience in, in politics, who he is, but his, his humor is, uh, is also a tremendous asset uh, to him, but sometimes it could be very daunting to uh, novice uh, MPs like myself. So uh, thank you very much for being extremely kind with uh, your introduction, Scott. Um, uh, and Peter, you said that video is going to be quite something, and it really was. Uh, it's truly tremendous. Um, uh, uh, Secretary General, thank you very much uh, uh, for being here with us. Mayor Savage, fellow ministers, parliamentarians, ambassadors, members of the Canadian Armed Forces, distinguished guests, good afternoon. Now, before I begin, uh, I just want to say that um, what, how much of a privilege this actually is. Uh, years ago, um, I was watching TV and just ran uh, running through the channels and I saw this forum and I heard the discussions and it was really amazing the type of discussion that was being had here and I thought wow uh, I'd love to be part of part of that discussion and little did I know that I could, that I'd be standing here so it's a real uh, privilege and honor for me uh, to be part of this uh, discussions and thank you for making it uh, a, a tremendous um, uh, international security forum so it's great to be back uh, in Halifax hosting this important forum uh, for my third time now. Uh, it's heartening to see friends uh, and colleagues here from across Canada, but more importantly from around the world. Um, and I think I can speak for all of us to express the uh, tremendous gratitude uh, to our uh, HISIS President Peter, uh, uh, Peter von Prague and his amazing team for their tireless effort uh, for organizing this wonderful uh, event. So a round of applause for Peter and his team, please. So like a number of you, I have come to Halifax straight from Vancouver, uh, my hometown, uh, where Canada uh, served as the host of the United Nations Peacekeeping Defense Ministerial. And we were extremely proud to welcome 500 delegates from 79 countries and five international organizations to British Columbia. Uh, in our opening um, uh, moments together in Vancouver, we challenged ourselves. A challenge to be frank in assessing what is working and what is not. Uh, in our efforts uh, on peacekeeping. A challenge to make a greater, di greater difference on the ground where it matters by defining and pursuing a modern form of peace building and peacekeeping. A challenge to explore new and better ways of training, promoting economic development and empowering women. Together, we rose to that challenge. We explored what we could do better and what we must do differently to improve operational effectiveness and support peace operations in areas of instability. We took action that reflects the need to bring new gender perspectives to peacekeeping. I was especially pleased to see that of the 48 uh, delegations that made new, uh, new peacekeeping uh, pledges, 26 of them included promoting the participation of women in United Nations peacekeeping operations and um, uh, an, an international uh, military-led gender champion network was formed, and it's going to be championed by General Vance. My colleagues and I also made meaningful pledges to address capability gaps and strengthen current and future UN missions. Canada's commitment uh, to increase our support to the United Nations peace operations 
involves a multidisciplinary and whole of government approach, recognizing that this is not the peacekeeping of the past. We must do peacekeeping differently. This begins with Canada's new Women in Peace uh, Operations Pilot Initiative, consistent with our uh, feminist foreign policy. This pilot project will see Canada work with the UN and interested member states to develop innovative approaches to overcome the barriers, barriers to women's meaningful participation in peace operations. Now, women's rights are human rights. This is about ensuring that 50% of our population has a voice in conflict resolution. As you know, in terms of our capabilities, so we offered up and just give you the list, tactical airlift support of uh, one or two of our uh, transport aircraft. I know this will help the UN address challenges uh, meeting uh, regional airlift requirements to support the ongoing UN missions and the rapid deployment of UN forces when required and offer an also uh, of, of aviation task force up for, of up to four armed and two utility helicopters with spares included. And finally, a quick reaction force made up of a unit of a reinforced company and the accompanying equipment that comes with it. Kenda also made a new pledge to develop and implement innovative training initiatives to enhance the overall effectiveness of UN operations. This includes additional training support as well as contributions to a mobile training team and a Canadian training and advisory team to work with a partner nation before and, poten and potentially during a deployment when uh, conditions permit to enhance their contributions on a UN mission. Now together, the pledges in Vancouver will go a long way to help to protect lives in areas of conflict and assist the United Nations in fulfilling its responsibility to build uh, and preserve peace. On another note from, uh, from a Va Vancouver gathering, I take great pride in the fact that this week's ministerial was the forum through which we announced the launch of the Vancouver Principles, as Minister Bryson just mentioned, which represent a commitment to work together to prevent the recruitment of child soldiers. And a final note about Vancouver, I was encouraged by the, uh, uh, about the honest dialogue around the issue of sexual violence by peacekeepers. And as you know, Sexual violence is being used as a weapon in areas of conflict. We as an international community must do whatever we can to combat this criminal behavior. Now, the fact that Canada is hosting both a global ministerial and an international security forum, and doing so in the same week, speaks to our commitment to peace and security around the world. It reinforces our efforts to put in place by our recently released defense policy that ensures our country is strong, secure, and engaged. A number of you in this room contributed to the development of this policy. And as, I, as I've said to many of you personally, Canadians are grateful for your expertise and your cooperative spirit. For Canada, the development of this policy served as a tangible example of how the sharing of ideas and perspectives can translate into policy that responds to the challenges of our modern world. A world where many of today's threats know no borders, and many of today's combatants wear no uniforms. In hi in highlight it highlights the modern reality to of conflict, from new methods of warfare to the root causes of violence and radicalization, and an evolving incarnation of terrorism that cannot be met through military means alone. It explores the changing nature of peace operations around the globe that we sp spoke of in Vancouver. In response, to the rapid development of technology and the increased range of the threats posed within and through the cyber domain, which we will discuss here uh, at this forum. Through Strong, Secure, and Engage, Canada is investing in new equipment and new capabilities. And we have also recommitted Canada to an approach rooted in multilateralism. And we have placed an increased emphasis on training, advising, and assisting local security forces. As, it, as its name suggests, Canada's defense policy will allow our nation to be strong at home, secure in North America, and engaged in the world. Now, part of that enga engagement is expressed through our ongoing commitment to NATO and other key defense partners on the continents and around the globe. And to the Secretary General, I just want to say welcome again. Your presence uh, just elevates the conversation here. Now, this commitment is a cornerstone of Canada's defense policy. We continue that tradition today most notably through our deployment of up to uh, 455 troops to Latvia, along with the range of vehicles and equipment. We take pride in standing up and leading the NATO Enhanced Forward uh, Presence Battle Group in Latvia. We've also maintained a frigate in European waters, 
and we have engaged in periodic deployments of our fighter aircraft for air policing. Our government has also been unwavering in its support for the people of Ukraine and Ukraine's territorial integrity. We have been at the heart of international efforts to support Ukraine, including our current deployment of about 200 troops to Ukraine to assist with military training. We recognize that these engagements is vital not only to our own domestic security, but to global security. Many of Canada's closest friends and partners are here in this room. Together, we share not only a military alliance, we share a common vision for global progress, a shared set of values and principles that make us natural allies. This has long been the case, and it will remain this way, with Canada's strong and active support for the many years to come. But military power is no longer enough to serve the cause of peace and security. Governments must work with even greater vigor on conflict prevention and mitigation so that we can deal with the conflicts before they turn into armed conflicts. We must reduce crime in communities, communities and, in, and, in, and enable younger generations to commit themselves to education and brighter futures. Governments must involve NGOs, civil society, and the business community to each play a progressive and beneficial role. And we must ensure that our intentions in the world enable positive change for the long term and the conditions for a lasting peace. So ladies and gentlemen, we must all, always remember that in an increasingly complex and volatile world, none of us can hope to thrive in isolation. That's why gathering like this is so important. I'm reminded uh, of the words of uh, Lester B. Pearson, a father of modern peacekeeping. He's remembered uh, first and foremost as a prime minister, but he was also a military officer, a diplomat, a scholar, and a statesman, and a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Now, Pearson understood some 50 years ago that global conflicts were only going to get more complex and more difficult to resolve. As he described it, we are forever climbing the ever-mounting slope. Now, those of us gathered here uh, in the name of international security know the slope is becoming more daunting. But climb we must, and we must quicken our pace. But let's do so in partnership with the, uh, with the, with the highest ideals in pursuit of a better life for our people and a better and more secure world for everyone. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senior Advisor to the Halifax International Security Forum, Mr. Robin Shepard. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a very brief uh, scene change, almost a seamless web. Um, Secretary General, Secretary General Robin Shepard, please tell me. Um, well, I was going to start off by saying the real business uh, begins now, but after uh, Minister Sajjan's uh, remarks and the remarks of the other guests today, uh, I think uh, we've already got going, um, and I don't think uh, we really need much of a, of a warm-up. Um, the Halifax chats are designed to be a um, relatively short engagement, um, a quick interview style uh, discussion, but then we'll throw it open um, to all of you to ask questions to both the Secretary General and uh, Minister Sajjan. Um, so um, without further ado, I'd like to jump straight in, if I may, and, uh, and come to you first, Minister, um, on the back of your remarks. As you said, um, you've just had the UN uh, Peacekeeping Defense Ministerial uh, in Vancouver. Uh, to some, it's been billed as a kind of re-engagement of Canada uh, in peacekeeping. You talked of uh, hundreds of soldiers uh, being pledged. Um, more broadly, Canada is increasing uh, defense expenditure. Uh, forces are being deployed um, as one of the uh, four only four battle groups uh, in Eastern Europe. You're also involved in Ukraine. I, I guess my question is, why is this happening now? Uh, is it like uh, the Europeans with their, their new initiative this week, uh, which I'll come back to and perhaps uh, um, try and tease some, uh, some thoughts out of the Secretary General, because of the sense that 
there are new political realities in the United States, and they mean that all the Western allies are now going to have to do more to share uh, uh, the burden that's been, and let's be frank about it, disproportionately carried by the United, uh, the United States of America. So in a sense, is this all part of a, uh, a new point of departure in the West uh, and how it's led and who it's led by? No, th no thank you for the question. I think, um, as the saying goes, you cannot be an island of stability in an ocean of uh, turmoil. And our prime minister um, has repeatedly stated that Canada will be engaged in the world. Uh, multilateralism is, is important to us. And Canada will always contribute where uh, its resources, its expertise is, is needed. Hence the reason why uh, we um, uh, increased our participation uh, in Iraq, with the coalition, our uh, uh, an increased role at NATO, uh, where we uh, we felt that our leadership uh, could add value, and it's why we've uh, not only taken on the uh, the role as lead nation in Latvia, I'm very proud of that, but we've also uh, added the additional um, uh, air policing. Our frigate has also remained, um, but we also are, uh, we cannot forget about Ukraine. Um, we've had 200 troops there, and our efforts there are it's it's, uh, um, it's not done in isolation. It's, it's working together to send that very strong and collective message of deterrence uh, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, in this, this, um, this uh, new outward looking, uh, I'm not gonna say that Canada has not been engaged, Canada has been tremendously engaged in the world for a long time, but you know, there's a kind of mood around the world of, of introspection in many Western democracies. Um, with these ambitions, do, do you believe that you carry uh, the Canadian people with you? Uh, is this something that you feel, you know, when you speak to your constituents, when as a minister you speak more broadly to the Canadian people, uh, that, that, that they're on side in, the, in this in new engagement in the world? No, I, I'm fully confident that we are, for one thing, I think our, our Prime Minister campaigned on this, um, and more importantly, uh, when we conducted a defense policy review, we had a very broad range of consultations across Canada, and uh, from online talking to people, talking to experts, and that's one thing we heard, is having an increased role for Canada, where Canada can do its part. Um, and, and that's what we've done. But we need to do it in a responsible way. We have to be resourced, and that's why our current defense policy now is resourced uh, appropriately so that our military leadership um, can ha now have the predictable and sustainable funding so they can actually plan for the future. Having the right capabilities so that we can be engaged in the world, making sure that we have enough troops without burning them out. Uh, making sure they have the right capability so they can actually be an asset uh, to our partners. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of that fact and um, I am absolutely confident that Canadians uh, support this everywhere I've gone. Um, um, they've said this, but they said, they've also said it's do it in a responsible way. Um, Secretary General, I wanted to raise this issue of, of leadership, um, uh, of, the, of a sense that the, the health of our alliances um, with the additional reference, as I said I was going to, to the pronouncement um, this week by the European Union, it, it's not the, uh, the prettiest uh, of constructions of their permanent structured cooperation initiative. Um, uh, and this was signed up to by 23 of the 28 members of the European Union. It's been billed by some uh, as the beginning uh, of a genuine European army. Um, you may not be entirely surprised that uh, Russia today um, had a field day on the whole thing, uh, suggesting that it was a sign that the Europeans no longer have a f any faith in uh, US leadership. Uh, and they also had some particularly uh, 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 uncomplimentary words about NATO. And uh, the article I read was uh, headlined, Hasta la vista NATO. Um, now, I understand that if you spent all your time uh, trying to answer uh, the criticisms from Russia today, A, your blood pressure would be very high, and B, you'd have very little else to do. Um, but is there not a sense that the center may not be holding any longer, that there's a fracturing of our long-established uh, defense architecture. I'm sure, and you actually stated earlier in the week that you welcome the Europeans doing more, but I mean, surely there's got to be some underlying concern here uh, that things might be starting to pull apart, that the center might not hold. But first of all, I think you should welcome that the Europeans are doing exactly what we have asked them to do for many years. We, we, we should take a, a yes for an answer, meaning that the United States, Canada, NATO, we have been calling and asking the Europeans to uh, invest more in defense, to strengthen Euro the European defense, and when they start to do so, we are concerned. Uh, I, I, I can't understand that because uh, actually we want them to 
get stronger, and that's what they are uh, now uh, trying to uh, do. So, so I welcome uh, PESCO, or the Permanent Structural Cooperation, or Stronger European Defence, because I believe in stronger European uh, defence. It, it's, it's important for Europe, it's important for the European Union, and it's important for uh, NATO. Having said that, I, I will also underline the following, that European defence can be, be a very good thing if it's done in the right way. Uh, right way. But it can also be um, a challenge and a problem if it's done in the wrong way. Meaning that if European defence is, is perceived or launched or presented as an alternative to NATO, then it's dangerous. Because then it's undermining the transatlantic bond and the strength of NATO. But European leaders in the European Union, in European capitals, have stressed again and again that stronger European defence is not something which will compete with NATO, not duplicate NATO, not be an alternative to NATO, but it will actually strengthen the European pillar inside NATO. So as long as they stick to that, I think we should just welcome uh, more and stronger European defence. And let me add one more thing about this, because yes, European defence is good. Uh, more than 90% of the people living in the European Union, they are living in a NATO country. So there's no way you can strengthen European defence without also strengthening NATO. But no one has to, um, no, it's impossible to, to think that the European Union can replace NATO. Because especially after Brexit, we have to remember that most of their the defences are delivered by non EU NATO allies. 80% of NATO's defense expenditures will be by non uh, EU members, uh, meaning the United States, Canada, uh, UK in the West. Uh, then you have uh, big important countries in the North, as Iceland and Norway. Uh, and then you have in the South, uh, Turkey and, and Albania. So there is no way EU can do collective defense in Europe. That has to be done by NATO. I guess, uh, and I put to you, that, that the uh, obviating the risk that there is duplication, that you get into a situation where uh, the Europeans start setting up their own command structures and then it gets in the way of NATO's command structures. Uh, a lot of this, frankly, does come down to American leadership, I put to you. And we are one year since the election of President Trump. We are 10 months now uh, since he uh, assumed uh, assumed office. Um, I mean, this is crunch time, isn't it? We're not in the honeymoon period of a presidency. Uh, when you hear the rhetoric of President Trump and when you see uh, what he says, uh, I don't know whether you follow his Twitter account. Um, again, it might be a blood pressure issue. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, what do you actually think about American leadership in the world today? I mean, do you believe that President Trump is going to be able to hold these situations together? If you're starting to get some variation with the Europeans uh, and NATO in terms of how they're spending money, um, I mean, it is going to come down to American leadership. Are you confident that it's there? I'm absolutely confident that, that the United States is committed to uh, NATO. Uh, of course, uh, when you speak about American leadership, we speak about many different issues. We speak about climate change, trade, and, and many other issues. That's not for me to comment on. I am uh, here as Secretary General of NATO. I'm focused on uh, security and defense. And when we speak about security and defense, I'm absolutely confident that the United States, uh, also with uh, President Trump, uh, is. Uh, committed to uh, NATO and to the transatlantic bond. Uh, partly because he has stated that many times, not only he, but also he, the Secretary of Defense, Mattis, Secretary of State, Tillerson, and, and many others. Uh, but uh, uh, on top of that, uh, this is not only about words, but this is about actions, and actions speaks louder than words. We have to remember that for the first time since the end of the Cold War, uh, the United States is now increasing their military presence in Europe with more troops, with more equipment, with more exercises. And, uh, and the United States have more than tripled funding for what they call the European Reassurance Initiative, which is about funding U.S. military presence in Europe. So this is not only words, but also concrete actions in Europe. On top of that, we have Canada. So Canada is back in Europe. This is great. And this is, uh, Hodges and I, we are speaking about this every time we meet at the NATO Defense Ministerial meetings. And it's great to see that Canada is back. 
And I think Canadians sometimes underestimate the signal that sends the Europeans. We are used to the, America, uh, the, the United States. They are, they have always been there. But Canada actually left uh, Europe with land, permanent land forces after the end of the Cold War. Now Canada is back, leading the battalion in, the, in, in, in Latvia, uh, presence, uh, present in the, in the Mediterranean with the frigate and air policing. So having Canada and the United States back in Europe is not a sign of fracturing. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength and a strong transatlantic bond. Uh, Minister Sajjan, you are physically the closest ally to the United States of America. Um, uh, I think it'd be interesting to know on a day-to-day -day level in terms of the cooperation between uh, the Pentagon and your Department of, of Defense. You know, we all know, everybody in this room knows about some of the rhetoric on the campaign trail. And, you know, there were words about the obsolescence of NATO and so on and so forth. Uh, do you feel uh, uh, that that a line has actually been drawn and that the realities have taken over and that when you deal uh, with uh, the United States government, uh, that actually you feel a very strong partnership that, that, is, that is not in doubt in the way that some of the, uh, some of the rhetoric uh, over a year ago might suggest that it, it would be. No, I, I just want to echo uh, Secretary General's uh, comments here. Um, uh, what we've seen in action is actually a great commitment to NATO. Um, Secretary Mattis, uh, we've met a, a number of times, had discussions about this when he was, uh, he was appointed. And not only from our, our discussions, he has turned this in, into action and brought, uh, brings even greater unity, sends a very strong message of deterrence. And more importantly, I think uh, we underestimate uh, the, uh, the four battle groups, the, the, the EFPs, that were created. That was a decision made by leaders. And within a year, they're fully operational. I mean, that is a tremendous feat. Um, not just from, uh, from a decision political making sense, but from our militaries, because it's not just about sending a battle group, it's about bringing many nations together. The interoperability, the discussions that, that were had, it's, uh, uh, I was uh, personally very uh, impressed uh, by, by this, and uh, uh, Jens and I got to visit at, at, at the same time. What this is also doing is allowing our, our, our military members to be able to train together. So this is, um, I mean, there is a message that we're sending to Russia, obviously, from a message of deterrence. But the interoperability that we're seeing and demonstrated is, uh, uh, is also um, very good for us as well. You know, when you and the Secretary General has raised Canada um, as, as an example, perhaps, uh, um, he hasn't quite put it this way, he's a diplomat as well, to other countries, uh, and you mentioned Russia, and, and I wonder whether your, your stronger engagement in Europe, in, in, in Latvia, as you mentioned, which is a former Soviet republic, uh, in Ukraine, uh, which is also a former Soviet republic, have you seen uh, a downturn in your relations with Russia because of this? Have things become a little bit tougher? Um, as Minister of National Defense, I mean, my focus is to making sure that we have the right resources in place so that we um, can send a, the appropriate government message. And it's through uh, not only from a bilateral sense, uh, it's working directly with Ukraine, but more importantly through NATO. And we're doing that. Um, but for us, sending the appropriate message um, of uh, demonstrating the unity and resolve of NATO is extremely important, and I think we've, we're doing that extremely well. But we need to make sure that uh, the door is always open for dialogue, um, because at the end of the day, we, uh, de-escalation is the eventual goal, so that we can really focus on some of the other threats that we all face around the world. And ev every nation is, uh, is, um, has a threat of, uh, of, of terrorists. Canada's not immune to this. And that's what we need to do. Um, but I'm extremely confident with the support uh, that the, the U.S. has given, um, and that uh, we are sending a, a, a tremendous message of deterrence uh, as we speak. I'm sure we'll come back to, the, to that question uh, in the question and answer session. Um, I wanted to move on, or rather to move back to one of the, uh, the issues that you, Minister Sajjan, raised in your remarks, uh, because it was very clear to me in following uh, the Vancouver summit, and also uh, in London the year before, the ministerial in London, um, that the issue of women in international security, uh, it, it really does look as though we're going beyond rhetoric here. I mean, you know, the, the naysayers and the, and the cynics say, well, it's very easy to talk about uh, women's rights. It's a fashionable item and so on. Uh, I find it extraordinary. We, we have in one of the, um, the essays that's been written for, uh, for this conference by uh, Nancy Lindborg, who I wonder if is here in the audience. I hope she is. The President of the United States Institute of Peace. Most 
wrote, wrote a terrific piece about women in international security, pointing out that there, there is tremendous amount of research showing that when women are involved in operations, particularly in conflict resolution, there's just a much better chance of success. In other words, it's not just the just thing to do, it's also very much in our interests. Now, you've made pledges uh, to, to, to do that yourself. What I want to know, and what I'm interested to know from, from you, and also Secretary General uh, in NATO, is everybody really on side? I'll take you at your word that Canada's on side. When you talk to your counterparts, are people really going to make this happen? Um, first of all, I mean, this is extremely important. Um, and I'll, I'll just be very frank. Um, the, any naysayers has really just have to get over it. This is extremely important for us to do. We have to. No, absolutely. We, we have to do this. Because if you don't touch 50% of the population, how are you going to solve conflict? If you don't uh, empower women um, into leadership roles, increase the number of women, how are you going to deal with some of those threats? So. The research shows it, the will is there. This is not political correctness. This is a, is a necessity of our time. And if we don't take leadership, every nation doesn't take leadership on this, we're going to be sending our blood and treasure, uh, which is our uh, women and men in uniform, into harm's way. We need to reduce conflict and take every opportunity. And this is one thing, if we uh, uh, do this substantially, will have an impact. We've demonstrated this on plenty of operations. We know that it has a better economic impact uh, as well. But more importantly, as we at the UN had talked about increasing the number of women on peacekeeping operations, the first thing we need to do is increase the number of women into our own forces. We're doing that, and General Vance is leading the charge uh, on this. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but we need to get beyond this conversation that this is a nice thing to do, political correctness or virtue uh, signaling, that this is a necessity of our time, and leadership matters here. Well, Secretary General, you're the, 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 the head of NATO, uh, which has uh, a, a lot of very important uh, uh, and actually very powerful Western democracies uh, under its umbrella. Um, uh, to what extent is, is NATO really trying to, uh, to put this kind of ideas into effect? I mean, can you be concrete as possible as to what is actually being done right now in order to, to make this a reality? I'll be concrete, but let me first of all uh, say that I totally agree with Hajit, because uh, to empower women uh, is the right thing to do, but it's also a very smart thing to do. And we have seen that in NATO, not least uh, through our military missions and operations, that when we have female soldiers, when we have gender advisors in our missions and operations, we are uh, able to talk to half of the population which are unwilling to talk to only uh, men. So. For instance, being in Afghanistan, we have seen that it is extremely smart to have a gender perspective on everything we do and to have gender advisors in our missions. And that's part of the practical examples is that, for instance, through our operations in Afghanistan, we have learned the importance of having clear guidelines to train our uh, uh, soldiers also to deal with gender issues and, uh, and to have at least some uh, uh, women uh, soldiers in the different missions and, uh, and uh, operations. Uh, so partly this is about working with our partners uh, to increase their awareness. Uh, it's, it's, it's for us to be very focused on how can we protect women in military operations because we know that women are often more vulnerable than uh, uh, men. Uh, and uh, it, also, uh, it, it is also about including m women in our own military structures and defense forces. When I was uh, a prime minister in Norway, we actually uh, introduced uh, female conscription uh, because it was a gender issue, but also we knew that that was a way to strengthen the strength uh, and the recruitment of the Norwegian Defence Forces. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have a long way to go in NATO, but we are now much more focused on how can we have more women also in leading positions. Uh, I remember the first meeting where Hajit uh, participated in uh, the Defence Ministerial meeting. That was the first meeting where there was actually one quarter, 25% of the ministers, defence ministers, they were women. Uh, that's not 50, but there are not so many years ago you hardly uh, were able to see one woman, uh, uh, one woman among the, uh, the defence ministers. So we are moving slowly in the right direction, both when it comes to senior leadership, but also when it comes to the work uh, on the ground. 
Thank you both for that. And again, this is a, something that people are free to bring up in the question and answer session. As I said, the style of the Halifax chat is very much quick fire and go on to uh, as many subjects as we possibly can. Secretary General, the, there is an issue that arose today uh, of importance to NATO, to, to a country which you mentioned, Turkey. Uh, there was a spat in the country of which you're the former prime minister, uh, uh, in which, uh, and it's a little bit vague as far as I can see, it looked like a rogue individual uh, had, uh, as part of a NATO drill, designated uh, uh, Kemal Ataturk, uh, the founder of modern Turkey, and Recep Erdogan, uh, the president uh, of Turkey today, as an enemy. It caused uh, the Turks to pull out from that drill. Um, uh, is there anything you can say just to give us a sense of what happened and 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 and, and what's? Uh, I mean, I know you've issued an apology. As I was just informed about this uh, incident this uh, morning, and uh, and uh, the the person that was responsible, he is uh, removed. Uh, I, I or my staff has been in contact with uh, with. Uh, uh, the Norwegian authorities and they told me that uh, there is now an investigation which has been launched and the person has been removed mm -hmm. and I have expressed my apologizes uh, on behalf of NATO to uh, Turkey. I also met with uh, uh, General uh, Akrar uh, from Turkey and we met uh, early this morning, the Chief of Staff, so so Chief of Defense. So, so I think uh, this is sorted out as uh, the incident uh, it was. The important thing for me is to express that that Turkey is a key ally uh, for NATO uh, for many reasons, but not least because of its uh, geographic, strategic ge geographic location, bordering Iraq and Syria, being key in the fight against ISIL terrorism, but also bordering uh, uh, Russia in the Black Sea. Uh, so uh, for NATO, it is important to work uh, together with a key ally as uh, Turkey. And as far as you're concerned, as you say, I think, uh, I mean, just looking at the Western media very frequently, Turkey uh, plays this tremendous role, this frontline role, uh, and, and yet is often underestimated. Uh, uh, your relations, as far as you can see, with Turkey and Turkey's commitment to NATO uh, is as rock solid as ever, and this is just one of those unfortunate events uh, that, that we get over and then get back to uh, the strong relations we've had for, for so many years. As the, the event in Norway will not create any loss problems and I think it's already in a way uh, behind us uh, uh, but the important thing is that we uh, continue to work with all 29 allies to respond to some of the big challenges uh, which also Turkey is facing the instability the violence we see uh, to the south of the alliance in Europe uh, uh, you have to remember that uh, NATO is bordering Iraq and Syria. We were bordering actually a territory controlled by ISIL. It was not something far away. It was very close to us and very close to Turkey. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Turkey has been key in that fight uh, where we now have achieved a lot, uh, meaning that we have been able to uh, uh, liberate most of the territory that uh, ISIL controlled. Uh, uh, Turkey has been key partly because of the Turkish forces, but also because of Turkish infrastructure, air, air bases, as a, uh, which has been used by the coalition fighting Daesh. And also because uh, we see now that Turkey is able to control the borders, which has been key uh, to uh, stop the supplies uh, to ISIL and also the flow of foreign fighters. So, uh, yes, these are important challenges for the whole alliance, including Turkey. Secretary General, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's have some questions. We have about 10 minutes left. If you could be as, uh, as concise as possible, that would be wonderful. Please. Thanks. I'm Paula Dobriansky, Harvard University. Mr. Secretary General, I first have a question for both of you, but uh, from where you're sitting, what is your an assessment of what Russia is doing up in the Arctic? And what is NATO doing about it, particularly the expansion of bases and other activities? And from the perspective of Canada, Canada, of course, being a member of the Arctic Circle and uh, no less looking at uh, the region, if you'd also give your view on that as well, Minister. Thank you. We see that uh, Russia is increasing their military presence uh, in uh, the Arctic. Uh, at the same time, uh, for NATO, uh, it is important to continue to try to uh, make sure that we have low tensions in the high north. Uh, and therefore, this is always a balance between uh, uh, responding, uh, but also trying to respond in a way which is not... Uh, uh, escalating uh, the tensions up in the high north because traditionally high north has been characterized by low tensions. Uh, 
Um, we have to remember that five NATO allies are Arctic uh, countries, Canada, the United States, uh, Iceland, Denmark, and Norway. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, the high north is important for, uh, uh, for NATO. Uh, coming from Norway, of course, the Barents Sea, the big uh, uh, submarine bases, the, the Russian submarine bases on the Kola Peninsula are important for Russia, but then, of course, also important for us to follow what they do very uh, closely. Uh, 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 so we do this, uh, and part of what we all are addressing now in NATO is how we can adapt uh, our command structure uh, to be able to focus more on the North Atlantic and the importance of being able to uh, transfer uh, forces equipment, if needed, uh, in times of crisis, safely across the Atlantic. So we are, uh, both by adapting the command structure, focusing on the transatlantic, the reinforcement, uh, uh, with our military presence, uh, we are uh, also responding in the high north, but in ways which are uh, aiming at trying to keep the tensions uh, low. Thanks. And if, I mean, for us, uh, our defense policy uh, was created with the Arctic uh, in mind as a priority. So for everything from modernizing our equipment, our Arctic patrol vessels, actually they're being built here in Halifax, uh, modernizing some of our surveillance uh, from satellites to other systems, uh, looking at our infrastructure. But one thing I also want to stress is even though it's, it's uh, rooted in our defense policy, um, our sovereignty is not just strictly about defense. We have, uh, it's our communities, how do we operate in the environment, our Coast Guard, um, um, uh, the economic benefits um, uh, as well. Well, we need to make sure that uh, our security is based on how do we support the Canadian populations that are uh, living uh, up there. And so we're going to be looking at this from not just from a defense perspective, but a complete uh, total government uh, support. And we're working towards that. Um, and, but one thing, on the last exercise that I went to, I was in Rankin Inlet, and when you see the population there, when, when, you, when you can respond to the needs of your people up north, you know you have sovereignty and security. Thank you, sir. Can I, um, just a reminder to oh, yeah. everybody to identify themselves and. Uh, I just uh, to repeat the uh, my thanks uh, personally and the, on behalf of the uh, my president and the uh, my armed forces unit you know, of the secretary general, uh, because of you know the, his very positive, very constructive you know, the uh, immediate you know, the uh, approach to the issues, and then they take control the uh, content you know, the every on you know, the possible you know, the uh, implications. But at the same time, we're expecting the, the continuation of the investigation uh, on the, uh, that you know, the event. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Then the, uh, I have the presentation tomorrow morning you know, about you know, the ongoing issues in and around you know, the, uh, Syria and the Iraq, sacred issues, and uh, the, uh, i just stop you know, at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman there, please. Thank you. My name is Yaki Silia. I'm from South Africa. I came here. I'm from the Institute for Security Studies in South Africa. I came here after three days in Dakar where we discussed peace and security in Africa. And there was some expectation in Dakar that the imminent announcement in Canada would make some kind of a contribution to peacekeeping in Africa. And to be frank, the gap between the demand, 70% of peacekeeping is in Africa, and the Canadian offering seems to be huge. I think only the C-130 that you are offering is of any use in Africa. We need attack helicopters, we need tactical um, <coughs> transport, and so on. So I'm just wondering how relevant is the return of Canada to peacekeeping where the demand is, and the demand is in Africa. So um, I'm happy to answer that question. When it comes to um, uh, the commitment that we have made, we've actually taken all this into account. When we look at the... we. Um, the traditional peacekeeping has been um, pick a location, send your troops, and hope for the best. Right? It might have worked in the past and because the situation was different, but now we've actually taken into account that there are peacekeeping missions that are going on. There are troops on the ground. They're, they have certain uh, resources, but they also have the certain challenges. This is where the smart pledging um, comes in. So if uh, our smart pledging included not just the transport, uh, uh, um, the transport airlift, we're provide, we have now, we can offer up, up the uh, armed helicopters, utility helicopters, uh, where, where, it's, where it's needed. 
uh, a quick reaction force of a reinforced uh, company. But when it comes to the actual location itself, we want to make sure that when we, uh, the, the location is selected, one, it can be sustained, getting into a rotational basis with other nations. Otherwise, it doesn't have the impact. Yes, everybody's looking at jumping into one place. I get that. But we also understand that the current peacekeeping environment, conflict has been going on. There's the one military aspect of it. We also need to look at the root cause of some of the problem. That's why we're adding in some of the other initiatives. We need to bring in the whole of government approach. And I truly understand the frustration as well. We too uh, want to have the impact, but we need to do it differently. And that's what this is about. This is not the innovative training. We, we complain that troop contributing nations are not coming in well trained. So what are we going to do about it? So this is one of the reasons why we're looking at offering a uh, potentially a uh, pre-deployment training for a troop contributing nations. And when the situation is correct, we will actually deploy with them and mentor them. Some, uh, we've learned how well this works. We've done this in Afghanistan. We were doing it in Iraq. So this is about looking at the challenges, but more importantly, working with the undersecretary generals on this. These are exactly the things that they needed. So it's not about just pick a location, send it. This is about actually looking at modernizing the support and supporting peacekeeping for the long term. Because if you can't sustain some of the capabilities, well, you're not going to have much of an impact. Um, finally, we are just down to uh, one and a half minutes, uh, and as I, I repeat, these are very quick fire and can be different subjects all at once. I wanted to close just with one question to both of you, uh, and it comes back to NATO. Um, is NATO's door genuinely open to new members? Are Ukraine and Georgia seriously one day going to become members of NATO? Uh, do you want them to become members of NATO? Perhaps I start with uh, uh, Minister Sajjan and conclude, and these will be the concluding remarks uh, with the Secretary General. Well, first of all, when it comes to Ukraine, there is no, I think I can put down on heart to say that there's no greater support than Canada. Uh, we have over 1.3 million uh, uh, people from Ukraine in, 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 in Canada. Uh, we are uh, uh, extremely sensitive to the situation of what Ukraine is actually going through, the illegal annexation of Crimea, what's happening in the Donbass. Uh, we need to focus on dealing with the, the main issue uh, at hand first um, and uh, work towards the Ukrainian armed forces uh, with the reform so they can eventually, um, um, uh, you know, not only getting into NATO, but becoming on a sustainable footing um, uh, for its own nation as well. And if we get through those problems, Canada's position is that you would welcome uh, Ukraine and Georgia into NATO as full members. Secretary General. The NATO story is so open, and uh, uh, the best proof of that, that is that uh, since the end of the Cold War uh, up till now, the number of members of NATO has uh, almost doubled. Uh, second, uh, we uh, got a new member uh, this year. Uh, Montenegro joined uh, NATO uh, uh, this spring, so we went from 28 to 29 uh, members uh, this year. So NATO's door is open. Um, uh, then, of course, to become a member of NATO, you have to meet the NATO standards, you have to reform, and the focus of both Georgia and Ukraine is now on reform. Uh, to modernize the defense institutions, uh, uh, to fight corruption, to strengthen the democratic institutions, and NATO and, and Canada and allies are helping both Ukraine and Georgia uh, uh, with implementing uh, those uh, reforms. And at the end of the day, uh, it will be 29 allies uh, that decides whether we invite a new member uh, into the alliance. No one else has the right to try to interfere or to veto such a pr process. It is uh, the sovereign right of every nation to decide its own path and then for the alliance to decide uh, whether we enlarge or not. If this is the last thing I say in this forum, I would just thank uh, Canada, I would thank uh, Hajit and I would thank uh, uh, all of you for inviting me because I think to be here in Canada and to express how the grateful we are for all the contributions of Canada to NATO is important for me because I, I, I really appreciate uh, both the uh, contributions in soldiers but also uh, with equipment and also all the experience and the knowledge that Canada brings to the table every day uh, in this alliance. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well. Um, we've, we've covered a lot of ground in 30 minutes. We're going to cover an awful lot more over the weekend. Uh, once again, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg and Minister uh, Sajjan uh, for such a wonderful discussion.